equation. So your whole body's a mathematical ratio. Some bitches is predetermined to get fellatio, while others are predetermined to be a great mate for you. But most niggas can't add, because the educational system is ass, so the scissors is trash. Ladies and gentlemen, the So What Morning Show, back again, it's Mondays. Just let it ride. You know I feel it. Chase Skizza. You can't blame them, no. Their design is intelligent. And I ain't talking about no heaven. Oh! T-Radio-V.com. That's Radio NTV. The So What Morning Show back in the building with another topic. Let me just jump to it real quick. Community empowerment. You know how we do. Books, businesses, and also a call to action. Very important call to action. I try to highlight situations that are going on in our community that maybe we don't know about, but need our attention. And more important than our attention is our movement. We have to galvanize around particular causes, right? You may not know about it, but I got a brother here, right, who was brought to me by another friend that has been going through a situation that's in the media. You might not have been reading about it, may not have heard about it, but it's very important because it speaks to something that's going to lock directly into our topic today, discrimination. Really quickly, Fox Sports has been sued for race discrimination, right, by a fired African-American executive. You may not have heard of him, but he was there 17 years and never got a promotion, and then unceremoniously fired. Overlooked many times, never got a promotion. And this is a person who is a linchpin for what they've been doing over the past seven years, right? Uh, an integral cog. Without further ado, let me bring the brother in. He's a good friend of my homeboy, Cool Mo D. And of course, my other homeboy, Adrian. <laughs> I ain't going to put Adrian. Adrian Miller, by the way, <laughs> the big homie. He brought him in to me. Welcome to the show, man. Could you explain to me exactly what's been going on? What's your story? Well, <clears throat> it's a long story. It's, it's evolved over a long period of time. It's taken me some time to kind of um, really wrap my mind around the circumstances and, and, and so forth. Because the thing that one of the things that I really want to represent in this discussion with you, though, is that you know discrimination, racism, lack of diversity, those sorts of things? Um, you know, it's particularly particularly racial discrimination has become very very sophisticated now. Um, there's very few card carrying members of the KKK. There's a lot of people who have become um, you know sensitive to that type of behavior, and they just kind of do what they want. They kind of operate on ignorance. And I know that um, in the 16 years that I was at Fox. Um, the position that was directly available above me, which was vice president, I was passed over four times. And on a couple of occasions, I was not even told that the position was even open. And mm. um, one of the things that they did is in the process, they would keep changing the requirements and, they, and the standards for becoming a VP. At one point, uh, you needed to be a lawyer. At the next point, you didn't need to be a lawyer. Um, they've hired people with high school um, diplomas. Uh, I attended the University of California at Berkeley and UCLA, hmm. but I couldn't get, you know, proper consideration. And the thing that makes it, you know, even more special is that just remove me from the equation. Just forget that I exist. When you take a look at the infrastructure of Fox Sports, then it's really telltale. Mm -hmm. You know, um, of the roughly 34 corporate executives or so that they have, um, in 19 years, there's never been an African-American executive. I believe that they've made one, they've appointed an African-American as an executive after I sued. Um, and then when you combine that with the other Fox Sports business units, um, we're looking at roughly 141 vice presidents and above. Mm. And in the 19-year history of Fox Sports, at least from when I was there, of the 141 VPs and above, they've had roughly six African-Americans, and I think they currently have four. Mm -hmm. So that's less than 1%. So it's not that you weren't qualified. No, absolutely not. It's not that no, no. you were somehow incompetent and incapable of no. handling the position, no, right? No. Executing your duties according no. to the job description. You had all of that. Absolutely, no doubt. Hmm. So there was no real credible reason for, A, one, why they didn't give you the job, and then, two, why they fired you? Correct. What was the purpose of that? 
The firing? Yes. I mean, it's hard for me to say. Hmm. It, it's hard for me to say. Um, <clears throat> I know that I went on a uh, disability in November of 2012. I was scheduled to return in February 2013, and on the eve of my return, they told me that my position had been eliminated. Um, but wow. I was calculated. They had planned on phasing me out for some time, mm -hmm. and I just didn't see it coming. I didn't think that it was going to happen because I've done so much good work. Right. You know, I mean, um, you're not going to find very many people who are as, as proficient in, in music and sports and has the context that I do. I've done tremendous, tremendously good work for the network, and of the people that have, um, you know, were my supervisors, um, you know, I'm the only person with any sort of tenure who's never been responsible for a lawsuit at Fox. So how do, how does my audience connect with you, help further your movement? I know you got a couple of hashtags. How do they connect to you and connect to me through you? How do they do it? Well. Um, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I got a couple right here. Can I say them? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, hashtag Jerry Davis. Hashtag get involved. And then please attach your emails, right? Because we're going to create an email database here, right? To create a movement. Mm -hmm. Because you guys have a plan that's Absolutely. bigger than just, okay, we want to sue Fox. Absolutely. Right? Fox Sports, right? Absolutely. And, and, and could you just really briefly, 30 seconds, well, tell them about that. Well, basically, you know, I know what happened to me, and I know what I've been able to observe at Fox Sports, and then they had the Donald Sterling situation, and I began to realize, especially after watching CNN and Anderson Cooper, I saw a segment with um, Steve Stout and with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and they said something along the lines of, of you know, in the sports business, in the in the sports business, there's a very, very um, uh, uh, big secret that's going on. And the numbers just reflect it all. And the numbers are very similar to what I just expressed at Fox. Mm. There's just not a lot of opportunity at the senior level. Yes, they have diversity on the camera. Yes, they have diversity at mid-management. But when it comes to the big senior dollars, level. At yeah. the senior level, and that's what needs to be highlighted and spotted. You know, wow. That's where the spotlight needs to be placed. So at listen. the senior level. Hashtag Jerry Davis. Hashtag get involved. Please attach your email and we will keep you guys connected. Just do that right now. Hashtag Jerry Davis. Hashtag get involved. I really appreciate you coming Thank and you. sharing this information. We're going to do more work soon in Thank the future, you. hopefully. Yes. And, and let's keep, like, you know, stoking this fire. I think it's important that we do that, right? Absolutely. Yes. Hey, this is great stuff. Now, community empowerment. Got to get Dr. G's book, Get Out of Your Own Way. Very important that you support Dr. G. He also has Just Listen, right? He also has Real Influence. Go to my website, IamZoeWilliams.com, and get the Rebirth of Seeds. Also, we have, you know, we have tremendous amount of businesses to support here. Ramomart.com. Please continue to support the brother. Uh, Easy Boy Web. Look at Ramomart stuff, man. That's, that's incredible. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Easy Boy Web. Right? These guys do websites and graphic designs. These are all black owned businesses. You got to support these businesses. Uh, also, uh, uh, Arise Hospitality. This is the black office max, the black staples, right? They get all of their stuff from the same suppliers of staples, but it's a black owned company. So it's not like if you have a staples account, and you sign up with Arise that you somehow lose the quality that Staples provides. They get the stuff from the same distributors. Um, oh, Taylor uh, Insurance and Finance. This is a brother. Again, he's a CPA. Well, I think he's more than a CPA, but he's a financial advisor. He's black owned. And again, he can help you get your financial life in order. This is stuff we need, right? And then, of course, BlackMastery.com. Very important that you support this sister, too. Veronica Conway also went to Cal, right? She created an NLP program, a neuro-linguistic program that undoes Jim Crow and <laughs> Willie Lynch. And it's hosted by Iyamla Van Zant. Wow. This is a hypnotic program that undoes the limiting beliefs that most black people grow up in American society with. I'm not enough. I got to work five, 15 times harder than the white person next to me. It undoes all types of limiting beliefs specifically designed and catered to black people. I, mean, I, I just, I've never heard of something so amazing. And then, one of my guests is here right now. I need his website. Who has it? Tariq Nasheed. Tariq, 
Come in here, Tariq. Where somebody get Tariq for me? Can can Tariq come in here? Go get him, cause I I, I really want to support Tariq. Hey, Tariq, come here, man. Yes. Tell him really quickly, cause Tariq, author, movie producer, Hidden Colors Three. Yes. Jesus, I mean the dude is doing some major heavy duty stuff. Where can they find the movie, the clothing, the books, your entire movement, the lectures, everything? Um, you can get the movies at HiddenColorsFilm.com. You can get the clothing at TarikaElite.com. And you can check out everything at KingFlexEntertainment.com as well. That's all I'm trying to say, man. There's a lot of stuff going on. Yes, I want indeed. people to this dude got glasses and shirts and jackets and shoes. But more importantly, he has content and information that's changing the entire community. That information you putting out in the Hidden Colors movie is changing the game on a high level, man. Indeed. And I want everybody to support it. The next dude I want to talk about really quickly, I got a few more minutes. Dr. Umar Johnson is trying to do this school. You, I know you know about it. Absolutely. He's trying to do a school. He's trying to take over St. Paul University, right? Absolutely. And turn it into a different type of academy. A Marcus Garvey, Frederick Douglass, you know, academy for young boys. Now, anybody, especially for the topic we about to do, young black boys are in trouble in America, period. And he's trying to create and raise five million dollars to create this school. Guess what? He doesn't even have a hundred thousand. Mm. He only had thirty days to get the bread. Mm. We spend one point one trillion dollars, dude, <laughs> annually. Black people, you know. Michael Jordan owns stock in privatized prisons, and you don't own stock in Jordans. But we kill each other for the Jordans. Yeah, absolutely. So he provides a means for us to go to prison by killing each other for the Jordans. And he still gets paid when you go to prison. Mm. But he's not donating to Dr. Umar to keep you out of prison in the first place. I mean, this is a cold situation. He has less than 100 grand. It's important that we support this. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, listen, we got to go. Take us out with the Black Mastery hypnotic induction. I want to see that. Yo, we'll be out. I'll be back in two seconds. And one of the greatest tragedies in life is getting to the end of your life and looking back and realizing it was mediocre and mm. it didn't have to be that way. The number one reason is people are unwilling to listen and care about what's important to the other person. Mm. But what if you could be someone who dared to care about everybody in your life? When you're in love, smoke gets in your eyes. Uh, but when you're anxious, you talk more than you listen. I asked my wife a month ago, I said, I don't know whether to have an affair or buy a motorcycle. And she said, if you have an affair, I'll kill you. If you get the motorcycle, you'll kill yourself. Go with the bike. So. Hey, hey, Doc, can I interfere in your, in your Well, you always tips? interfere. Uh, tee it up. Go on. Okay. So I have to acknowledge the, the young sister that's here right now. She caters for us. And, and, and I meant to say this during the community empowerment, tailor-made cuisine. Taylor Campbell, born and raised in the South Bay area of Los Angeles, California. She's the owner and founder of tailor-made cuisine. Listen, follow her on Instagram, at tailor-made cuisine underscore TMC. That's at tailor-made cuisine underscore TMC. On Twitter, at Tay, T-A-Y-M, catering, right? Uh, Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash Taylor May Cuisine. Please support this sister. She supports us. Seriously, she, is, is that why you, you, you've been eating? That shrimp wrapped <laughs> in turkey bacon is delicious. Shrimp so wrapped I've in turkey. Yeah, she brought that, right? It's so great. So I've heard. So I appreciate her for coming. And, and, and again, let me throw it back to the doc. Doc, set up the topic for today. Uh, okay, the topic for today is... Um, well, let me leave it this way. Uh, one of the problems I'm having is I can't get arrested. Wow. <laughs> wow. You hang out with me for a week here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what that's wow. about. I, I, I wrote this book, Get Out of Your Own Way. I wrote this 1996. And since then, I've gotten over 150 letters from people in prison and jails. And they're amazing letters. And I've been trying to get into the prison system or jail system. And I say, I just want to share these letters. We'll take the people's identities off, see if it speaks to the people there. They'll open up. Here's, the, here's a uh, one page. i got to read from a recent letter. 
this comes from, I won't tell you the first name, David, a venal state prison. Dear uh, Mr. Goulston, I've spent 31 years in prison for a first-degree murder I committed on another person. It took eight years before I had enough courage to write the family an apology. However, I minimized my involvement by blaming others. It took another 20 years to pen a true apology to the family, uh, see the enclosed, and in doing so, I took full responsibility for everything leading up to and including the murder of their son. Wow. Question. How does a parent cope after losing a child, or in this case, an adult son? Uh, and this was, uh, you covered this in Holding It All In, in your uh, book, Get Out of Your Own uh, Way. And what, if anything, can I express to show that I understand what this all meant to them? Finally, how can I make amends to the parents? Thank you for your time. And the three pages that follow this, which we don't have to read, it is one of the most heart-wrenching, articulate apologies to the parents of someone you murdered. Mm. And, and I got 150 letters, and uh, really, I, I, I've gotten into the tops of the prison system and the jail system, and then they flip me down two levels, and then I hit bureaucracies, and I throw my hands up. And, but anyone that can get me into jail, anyone that can break me into jail and prisons, I, I, I just, for free, I, I just want to get this going. Wow. Wow. Well, we appreciate you sharing that with us, and that leads us to our topic today. Heavy topic. Get ready. 855-878-4652 is the number to dial. Follow us on Twitter, at T Radio V. Follow me on Twitter, at Zoe Williams. Let's converse. Today's topic, the draconian world of privatized prison profits. A riveting look at the big business of mass incarceration. This is going to get crazy, right? Y'all already know, if you're watching what's happening in the world today, some very interesting things are going on. You got mass incarceration, and you also have mass deportation. Something's happening. And most people ain't looking at it because they caught into the matrix of 9 to 5, and then the weekend I get to work. Right? Or I get to play during the weekend. So they don't, really, of Atlanta. they don't really understand what's happening, right? What's going on. But let's go deeper into this. Questions. True or false? Aren't the terms justice and inequality polar opposite in meaning? How can there be justice in a system that thrives on inequality? Somebody call us at 855-878-4652. How does mass incarceration and mass deportation relate to one another? I just alluded to that, right? Are private prisons more violent than state-run prisons? Very interesting. And why does the door, the back door of school systems lead directly to the front door of prison systems? Somebody call us at 855-878-4652. Let's go even deeper. Should ex-cons and current prisoners be allowed some form of human rights, <laughs> right? Some people think, cause according to the Constitution, that's legalized slavery. We get to treat you like cattle, Absolutely. according to the Constitution, right? Where is the morals in the Constitution then? People want to give the Constitution so much credit for being this revolutionary thought about democracy and freedom, but a Constitution that has any form of slavery and dehumanization inbuilt, can that be called a constitution that's built on morals and integrity? I don't know. 855-369-9898. Let's go deeper. Have private prisons offered to buy state-run prisons under the promise that the state must keep the prison at or near full capacity? We're talking about business, then that means the prisoner is the product. So how do you keep the jail full with the product, right? How do you do that? We're going to get into this real deep, man. This is going to be a crazy show. That's enough questions for now. Now, let me introduce my August panel. Let's get active on this one. Ice Life, author, teacher. Educator, student, poet, HBO deaf poet, 
Dude is cold-blooded, man. Got his own day in Oakland. Ice Life Day. Director. D uh, director, actor. All of that stuff. This dude is cold, man. Y'all got to get with him, connect with him. Ice Life is in the building. Welcome to the here, show. Thank morning. you, man. Appreciate you coming. Dr. Mark Goulston, author of Just Listen, Get Out of Your Own Way, Real Influence, and many others. Man, he's a cold piece of work. He's going to add value to what we're talking about. Jeff Brown, intellectual irritant. That's me. That's me. That about sums it up. <laughs> no, the dude is cold blooded. You know how we get out. And of course, without further ado, one of my good friends, man, this dude is out here in the community doing real things for real. This is why we, we're pleased to have him here. He's busy. He's doing uh, movie premieres. <laughs> the dude is all over all types of tangerine carpets. <laughs> He's everywhere. Tangerine. <laughs> I'm saying you got to do something special for Tariq. You know? yeah. He's doing it big. You know what I'm saying? The, hey, producer, director, the dude created Hidden Colors. How important is that? And not only, he's in Hidden Colors Part 3. He didn't got a, a, a trilogy out of this thing, like right. the Lord of the Rings or something. <laughs> so I'm down with him 100%. Welcome to the show, Tariq Nashi. Yes, indeed. What's up, family? How's everybody doing? <laughs> yes, sir. So let's jump right into the topic. Right? Oh, one other thing. Sorry. A very important book that must be purchased regarding this topic. Sister out of the Bay Area, God a supporter, Michelle Alexander. She is a thought leader in this field. The new Jim Crow. I swear to God, if you don't get this book, man, you, you're just playing games. And if you're raising kids, if you got sons, you know, you're playing games. The new Jim Crow, mass incarceration in the age of colorblindness. This is the seminal work on this topic. If you don't get it, you're not serious about what's happening in our community. Got to support her. Listen, let's get into the topic. As black men, and Ice Life, you did an op-ed piece on this uh, with Huffington Post about what's happening to the young boys in the school system. Can you speak to that and, and, and give us some context to how serious of a problem we're dealing with right now? Well, in the... In the mid to late 90s, there was a report out of Harvard. The Neiman Report talked about, in reaction to what they were um, contextualizing as youth violence, was the development of a super predator, a quote, super predator that um, was developing in young black and brown boys primarily, and that they were a social powder keg ready to explode. And the way that the play went out is the, the, this legislation is handed down, or I'm sorry, this, this study from Harvard is handed down as a finding, not an opinion, but as a finding, which then led to legislation that passed and, and, and opened up gates for laws in California like Proposition 22, Proposition 21, the, um, all of these things that legalize a pipeline to prison. The article that, that Zoe is speaking to is an article I wrote called um, Kicking, black boys out of class teaching black girls a lesson mm. and what what I'm stating is that when you see Demarie, Jermaine and Tremaine from the second grade Dre to the Sean. sixth grade, Dre Sean <laughs> or Albert, you know, whatever his mama named him. Ain't no be, damn Albert, Steve. Okay, Jadavion. Being kicked out of class what does this say to the young girls in cl class with them that are potentially future mates for them? What ideas do these young sisters develop about young black boys? Um, in California, it was really great to see, particularly out of L.A., legislation passed that made it harder to just suspend or kick a student out of class because disproportionately who we saw being kicked out of class were these young black and brown boys, particularly black boys. And after that, what, what comes from that is, of course, the beginning of young people feeling marginalized from school and becoming more susceptible to the prison system. Wow. Listen, we're going to come back. But when we do, let's ponder what Ice Life is talking about via this question. I wonder what the research and development departments look like behind the walls of privatized prison. I can tell you. Are those R&D are those R &D departments not even at the school? I mean, not even at the prisons? Are those R&D departments at elementary, middle school, and high school? We'll be back to discuss it even further. So what mornings? How in a second. And the results have been predictable. Millions of poor people of color 
have been rounded up for relatively minor nonviolent drug offenses. In fact, in 2005, four out of five drug arrests were for possession. Only one out of five were for sales. Most people in state prison for drug offenses have no history of violence or significant selling activity. And during the 1990s, the period of the greatest expansion of the drug war, uh, nearly 80% of the increase in drug arrests were for marijuana possession, a drug now widely believed to be less harmful than alcohol or tobacco, and at least as prevalent in middle class and suburban white communities as it is in the ghetto. Michelle um, Alexander. President Clinton. Yes, I just wanted to bring it up to President Obama because this piece you wrote very interesting at TomDispatch.com called um, <clears throat> The age of Obama as racial nightmare. Explain. Yes, well, you know, today, people around the globe, um, people of color in particular, have been celebrating the election of Barack Obama as kind of our nation's triumph over race and the history of racial caste in America. Um, yet the appearance of racial equality, the superficial appearance of racial equality that Barack Obama's election has afforded um, serves to mask a deeply disturbing underlying racial reality, which is that large segments, you know, a majority of African American men in some urban areas are either under the control of the criminal justice system or branded felons for life locked in a permanent second class status. Um, this vast new racial undercast, and I say caste, not class, because this is a population which is locked into an inferior status by law and by policy. This vast population has been rendered largely invisible um, through affirmative action and the appearance um, of of, of success um, with you know, a handful of African Americans doing well in uh, universities and corporations, um, the sprinkling of people of color um, through elite institutions. In the oh United my States. God. Wow. Listen, this has been a very hard topic for me because uh, I'm gonna say this and I'm gonna throw it to my brother Tariq. I've quit things before, right? When, when I was 20, I set up my own little bookstore in Pasadena. And on Sundays, and this is while, you know, this is while I was at Loud Records as an A&R guy, Maverick Records as an A&R guy. I felt like I had to give back to the community. So I set up a bookstore. That bookstore blossomed and paid your company. And then we bought an ATM machine and, and airbrushing. And you remember the, the African-American college yeah, the, the sweatshirts, we were selling all of that. And on Sundays, I was teaching comparative religious studies. And I mean everybody from MC Ren, from NWA, Pasta Noos, from De La Soul, wow. was all coming to Pasadena in a room as big as this to hear us. There was dudes standing outside with tapes trying to record what was happening. And I did that from age 20 to 29. No business acumen. I just opened a business and kept it cracking. I didn't go to school for it. But I, I, I kicked niggas out because I felt like you just want to be associated with something that makes you feel good as opposed to really taking in the message of you doing it. Like, she just spoke on something that really hurts me, man. Our, our, our people think we good because we got position somewhere. And once we get position somewhere, we stop the fight with regards to discrimination and inequality. We think, well, I'm here. And then we got the nerve to look down. Mm -hmm. Well, look how I got here. I fought and did and whoop, 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 you should do the same. There ain't no bootstrap pulling. Yeah. Ain't, ain't no, no bootstrap boots. pulling for a system that is set for the 1% to remain one percenters. Fuck a five percenter, no yeah. disrespect. Yeah. But, but I'm a one percenter. Yeah. And I don't give a fuck what you you preach. Do you understand what I'm saying? No disrespect to the nations no, of gods and the earths, yeah. but that's how they view the whole situation, yeah. right? So I'm saying it hurts me and it makes me say to myself, okay, how long am I gonna do the Zoe West show? Yeah. Because 
there ain't no real movement. Mm -hmm. It's just I feel good that somebody talking like this. But this is the importance of the show, and I want to say this, and I, I know we pass into the brother, but sis, this is my sister. I know sister. Right. And she was a, 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 a lawyer, and it was a brother, a hood brother in West Oakland, and this is her story, that was coming to her with all kind of files, a brother from the hood saying, these police are arresting us and planting drugs on us. And these cases are getting thrown out, but nobody, and they coming down there and abusing. And she didn't believe it. She was doing social just, justice law work, and she didn't really believe it. She didn't act on it until the newspaper come out, something called the Oakland Riders, mm -hmm. which was uh, p people in the Oakland Police Department who were caught planting drugs. They, it was caught as a big documented thing, and that transitioned her. So these dialogues and these discourses, though I do agree there needs to be action behind the words, do rattle that thing from a cat in the street all the way to some, you know, since there's a, an affluent person speaking on these things. Now, we were brought here, African American people were brought to America to be a non-competitive labor class. Mm -hmm. We have to understand mm -hmm. that first. And during slavery, when slavery was about to end, we have to understand that 99% of the country did not want slavery to end. The South or the North. The North gets this pass for some reason. Right, right. right. They didn't want slavery to end. Mm -hmm. When slavery did end, they had to find a way to put us back into slavery. So in the Constitution, they said, well, everybody's free unless, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we always forget about that unless, yeah. they're convicted of a crime. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? Criminalize everything that black people did as a way to funnel them back into the criminal slave system. That's what we have to understand first. Let's work from that paradigm first. Mm. So now, when you see the image of black men, particularly, we're criminalized every single day. So this will justify putting us back into the, the prison system to work. When you go to prison, people don't know that it's mandatory mm. to work in prison. It's not like, oh, I don't want to work. You get put in solitary confinement if you do not work. It's mm -hmm. mandatory to work in prison. They force you to work. Mm -hmm. And prisons around the country, they send out videos and memos to corporations around the world saying, hey, stop dealing with China. We'll make those products here. Mm -hmm. Slavery and the prison industrial complex is big business. People don't know that black crime is actually down in America. This is why they always point to Chicago. Whenever mm -hmm. they talk about black crime, mm -hmm. what about Chicago? What about Chicago? Because that's the only place where there's a lot of crime on a regular basis. Since there's not a lot of black crime, they have to do what's called all-in laws to fill up those jail cells. Mm -hmm. Meaning, out here in California, they have what's called gang enhancement mm -hmm. laws. So if one dude commits a crime, mm -hmm. has on a blue belt, and me and Zoe and Jeff are with him, we, we all crips. go to jail. We, we all yeah. crips. We all, it's crips. Mm -hmm. It's a gang crime. Guilty then, by association you're guilty is by association. now a law. That's the law now. <laughs> so now they can call it street harassment or street terrorism. Or you're put on probation, they give you what's called a four-way clause, which means that the police stop you, they can charge you for so, the person that's sitting next to you four different ways to find you guilty, even if you haven't done anything and retain, entertain you. So, so listen, guys, this is science being dropped right now. We've got somebody on the line, a, a, a lady. Her name is, uh, I, I don't want to pronounce her name incorrect, Callie, Kaylee, Kaylee Schilling, MTS. Kaylee is the director of the Violence Prevention Coalition of Greater Los Angeles, an umbrella organization whose membership includes government agencies, nonprofits, and individuals committed to ending the epidemic of violence in Los Angeles County. She brings over a decade of experience working in and with nonprofits. Current priorities include facilitating an arts based intervention of incarcerated youth network. Listen, she's on right now. Her, her credentials are thicker than a phone book. That's not important. What can she do to bring clarity to this conversation? Are privatized prisons targeting the poor and immigrants and people of color? And if so, why? Go deeper, please. Hi, am I on? You definitely on, Kaylee. That was for you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Um, I, you know, I mean, the short answer is is yes. Uh, I think the the longer answer is is what what are the things that uh, that, that are contributing to that. And, and you guys have touched on a lot of them uh, on, on the show that there there is uh, there is this structural 
um, system that, that has been set up that, that involves, as, as Michelle Alexander has documented tremendously in, in her book, The New Jim Crow, um, looking at how we have criminalized uh, behavior that we don't like um, and, and created a, a second class um, of folks. And, and actually that, that because it's framed as uh, people with convictions or, or felonies, um, that somehow makes it safe and takes it out of a racial domain. Uh, when, again, if you look at the data of how it gets enforced, it's very much uh, enforced disproportionately among among communities of color. So One of the things we talk a lot... Oh, yes, so, so, no, really quickly, you said something very important. They've changed the dialogue to seem colorblind, but the actual enforcement of this stuff becomes very racial, you know, when you start seeing who's going to jail, who's being pulled over, who's being sent to jail with these large, you know, sentences and, and, and things that we, we've all seen the crack versus cocaine sentencing. So you're saying, although the terminology isn't racist, the actual execution of the law is? Is that what you're telling me? What I'm saying is the data supports that there is there's disproportionate uh, representation among, among communities of color, yes. Wow. Uh, and wow. I think that that, that tracks back, uh, you know, uh, one of the things we talk a lot about in the Violence Prevention Coalition is really seeing criminal, uh, seeing violence as an issue of public health rather than an issue of criminal justice. And, and one of the reasons why we talk about that is because if you see it as a, as a health issue, if you really see violence as an epidemic, um, then, then you start to look more at the root causes and the structural uh, systems that, that are causing it rather than individuals making bad choices. I think there's a tendency uh, with this to say, you know what, individuals are bad, these are bad people, these are bad kids, a lot of times making bad choices. Um, and that's very easy then to scapegoat individuals and to say this is a person-by-person -person issue rather than saying, rather than holding the systems accountable and saying what are the things that are happening, for example, some of the work that we do, uh, with a number of partners is is looking at, at really? schools yep. Um, yep. and how early do we start sending kids to spending kids don't be scared Doc. Um, from elementary school and, <laughs> Kaylee, and Kay sending them yep. into detention to Kaylee, uh, this is uh, the the doc in the show I have, a, I have a question something I brought up a couple shows ago was an insight I had about why uh, why black women and why white people don't trust black men and mm. I'm wondering if it applies maybe to young black children. The idea being that uh, if in your mind you think that uh, if people uh, thought about you the way you think about these people, in your mind you would, you would have a confirmation bias that these people must be angry, these young black children must be angry, and then when you see them acting up with one little hiccup, it confirms your confirmation bias and then you take action. And do you think any of that is going on psychologically, that if in your mind you, you know what it's like to have something uh, stacked against you, you can't believe they're not angry because you would be angry if that was you? There's, I, I like to give a little pushback to what Doc is saying, though, only because, it, you know, my firm, um, we worked for two years with Kaiser Permanente. And it was really interesting, you know, having Kaiser as a client and working with doctors. And doctors are trained, doctors are trained with something called that, that you have unconscious bias. So a vastly white, also mm -hmm. Asian, Indian, mm -hmm. you have unconscious bias. And there's a breakdown of like, so, you, so you're not racist, it's just an unconscious bias. Whereas with us, it's never broken down that deeply. You know, it's always like, if we do something wrong, it's because you're a criminal. And why are you so mad? Yeah, and why are you so mad? Well, basically, because I, I, know, I know the heart space you're coming from. But I, I think maybe in 2014, it's time to go, you know, largely, white folks are racist. <laughs> It, 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 it racist, prejudice, and we, it, there's there's a whole record. Forget Tremaine's criminal record. Look at Let's the look history at white channel. Historical record, and then also if there's a, and, and then when we talk about white supremacy, it doesn't mean someone's in a Ku Klux Klan. Absolutely. Doesn't mean that Absolutely. white supremacy. Just saying, just that the idea that white people are supreme in this system, yeah. and that and and so because 
that narrative that you're giving, Doc, almost implies that, well, it must be this kind of deeper thing, duh, 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 when it's just really based on some, some inhumane cruelty being asserted from this part of our society that should be reconciled, forgiven, and, and dealt with. That's what I think. Absolutely. And now, uh, Michelle Alexander, for example, she was in my movie Hidden Colors 2. Mm -hmm. We talked about the prison industrial complex. And we talk about how children, black children, are funneled into the prison system from school. It starts in school. The minute a kid does something wrong in class, the middle-aged white teacher criminalizes them right there, whereas white kids, they have to literally shoot a school up yeah. before they say there's a problem. Yeah. Wow. And the problem is they need therapy. Exactly. <laughs> Listen, hey, therapy over prison, right? Yes. Therapy over long, exaggerated terms, Which right? Which is what I'm looking forward to talking about. Wow. Listen, we need to talk to Little River. No, this is cold. I, I mean, like I said, man, Come listen, on, we River. listen. We got to take a quick break, Little River. River, bring Chad with you. Let's <laughs> go discuss our feelings. Let's hash it out. Put down right? the gun. <laughs> That's right. We're going to use styrofoam guns, okay? And we'll, we'll shoot blanks. Nigger, <laughs> six o'clock! <laughs> get out! Your face! We'll be Not back at 2.2. So what? Get him! <laughs> He knew a Scranton jury. It convicted a former Pennsylvania judge in a so-called kids for cash scheme. Prosecutors say that Mark Chivarella accepted millions in bribes and kickbacks for putting juveniles into detention centers. Those for-profit detention centers were owned by friends. Chivarella was found guilty of racketeering and fraud, among other things. One distraught mom lashed out after that verdict. Her son committed suicide after being sent to a detention center for a minor offense. My kid's not here, he's dead! Because of him! He ruined my f***ing life! I'd like him to go to hell and rot there forever! Do you remember my son? An all-star wrestler? He's gone, he shot himself in the heart! You scumbag! Chivarella is uh, free on bond until his sentencing he could face 157 years in prison. And... But what happens to the corporation? Uh, well, that's the problem. No, no different from the bailout. You see what happens here, but even, like, the, so he's being held accountable, this one person. Mm -hmm. But they're very vague about who was kicking back. Right. Who was, who, who was paying him to, to, to lead this incarceration and keep that quota filled. That's a, oh, that's yeah. a deep thing. Oh, and, yeah. and now in, in California especially, but throughout the country, what's really intense is they're giving young people under the age of 18 life in prison. The science is saying that your frontal lobe is still developing until you're 22 until years you're old. Until you're 22, 25, yeah, somewhere yeah. around there, yeah. But, but they giving these babies life in prison at right. 16. Yeah. Well, that's bread. Yeah. California is, lead, is one of the leaders in privatized prisons. It's bread. Yeah. And so when you see these non-lethal weapons, I want to speak to this, and then I'll be quiet for a long time. When we see Hilarious. These, when, we see, <laughs> when, when, we see, when we see these non-lethal weapons, you go, oh, the, the police are humane. They think, well, let me ask you something. If... Tremaine is cutting the corner, or Jorge is cutting the corner, and you shoot him with a bullet and kill him, what does that do? But you knock a rubber bullet on him, or hit him with a stun gun, long, and it decapacitates him long enough to go to trial and be sentenced to 50 years in prison, it's a lot more money in him sitting in the can that's than it. you murdering him on the street. And that's a deep thing to me. And, and, and this is why the Sisters book is so powerful, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the new Jim Crow, because, and Tariq could speak to this as well, back in the day, when you were freed, quote unquote, when the slaves were freed, Emancipation Proclamation, all that, we're really free. You, you know, there was an opportunity for you to go back to the plantation, and when you went back to the plantation, you had to work off a debt. Same thing happens today. That's why she, uh, the, the analogy of the new Jim Crow. As soon as a, a guy gets out of jail, right, right off the top, discrimination because you're a felon, right? right off the top and then a lot of times you got to pay restitution mm -hmm. and then you got to pay child support and some of these guys their checks are being uh, uh what's the term again garnished, garnished 100 percent mm -hmm. a lot of times you can't go like if, if your mom and them is on section eight you can't live with mom and them because that's going to mess up the section eight so you ain't got nowhere to live so you go back to a system that has all locked doors and expects you to pull, up, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. I'm trying to tell you, man, it's not designed that way. It's designed, this, like she said, it's a caste system. We've got people in the building right now, more people that's going to contribute to the conversation. Of course, Jasmine, Melodiously Fly, one of the most 
Jasmine Mitchell, by the way, artist, singer, I mean, provocateur, intellectual provocateur. She be going in like a warrior princess from Zamunda on these fools. <laughs> and that's why... <laughs> I am here. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I bring her to the show, man, because she, she has a very. I just saw her ride up. What animal was going on? Those were hooves. Do it again. No, no, no. Those were bad throat noise. Don't worry. Don't worry. So I don't know if anyone mentioned this, but I was thinking that I recently learned that the private prison industry, they can sue the state if they don't provide right. them with enough bodies. And that shocked me. It happened in Arizona where some of these quotas range from they have to be at least 70 to 100 percent full. Mm -hmm. And if the state doesn't provide the bodies, they can sue them. How about it? Which is crazy. And this is irregardless. <laughs> this is irregardless of the crime rate. Yes. Now, listen, we got somebody in the building. Who, who's been locked down for a dub. Yeah. 20 years. 16. Right? Well, that's a long time. That's a long time. Please tell the people your name and your story. That's why you're here. Let's go. My name is Frankie Carrillo. Born and raised here in Los Angeles. Typical family, specifically Linwood, if anybody knows where Linwood's at. Linwood. Compton, Watts, you get the idea, right? 16 years old. Uh, actually, 15 years old, typical day in the city, uh, deputy sheriff just sort of pulls us over. Me and my boys are on some bikes. Not much is going on in summertime. And he says, hey, you got a girlfriend. What school do you go to? Where do you live? You got a mom, dad. By the way, can I take your photograph? What are you going to say, no? We say, yeah, I guess. You know, go for it. Takes her picture. Day goes on. He takes off. About a year and a half later, there's a crime committed. That photograph is used in a photo lineup. The young boy, 15 years old, picks my photograph and wrongfully, wrongfully picks my photograph, and this nightmare begins. So, tragedy, man was uh, drive-by shooting, innocent man was murdered. Got even worse when they got the wrong guy in prison for it, which was me. Tried as an adult, 16-year-old boy, and um, it went from there. It turns out that, um, I won't get too, too ahead of myself, but they gave me 30 years to life plus life, so I was convicted. Wow. Hit the joint, you know, I'm in YA, I hit prison, and I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm not going to accept this. I mean, I have no social equity, but I'm saying, like, as, a, as a human being, I'm going to fight for this. If that means writing letters and complaining and crying and asking and begging for help, I'm going to do that. And I did that for 15 years. Finally got the attention of some law firms, some people who wanted to hear me out. It took them five years to find the evidence. The evidence was these six boys who came and testified against me all lied. They were, uh, they were coerced by the sheriff's department to pick my photograph. The cop lied. And the cop was, you know, it's one thing to say the cops lied. It's the cop's fault. But in my case, has anyone heard of the Viking scandal? So, or Rampart, LAPD Rampart. Oh, yeah. So Vikings. Daryl Gates. Exactly. So Vikings, <laughs> Vikings is part of the, the, the sheriff's department scandal back in the late 80s, 90s, in that part of the, of the world, you know, Linwood, Compton, Watts. The cops involved in my case were these Viking dudes, neo-Nazi, racist, uh, not, and they weren't just doing what they do, what you hear about, you know, shooting people and, you know, things of that nature. These dudes were falsifying police reports, which is, I think, worse. They were going to court and lying in front of a jury, which is, I think is worse than killing somebody in, in some cases. And, and that's what they did. This dude killed me with his words, with his testimony, he along with the other guys. So I've been home now, I've been home now for three years. So in 2011, I was, I was exonerated, which is a new word, you know, in my vocabulary. Right. And uh, life has been good, man. Tell them you know? about LMU. Come on. So, you know, a month after I got out, a good friend of mine, Scott Wood, and some other folks uh, put me up with the guys at LMU, the, the president and vice president and so on. And, you know, my dream was always to go to school, you know. And, and, and lo and behold, I'm out now. I'm thinking, shit, why not? Now is the time. I've been a full-time student ever since. Um, sociology is my thing, you know, and I'm doing that. Forgive me. Did I say sociology? That's what you said. That's, yes. what, I, that's what I meant. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> I thought he was going to go all the way from, no, no, did I say sociology? I meant pottery. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going and, uh, and life has been good. You know, it's, it's sort of weird, man, to go from a 20-year incarceration to a university. But, but on some level, I think I, I mimicked what I was used to. So I'm used to structure. 
being on time, you know, and that sort of uh, uh, regimen in my life. It's like and university, military, right? University sort of gives me that. Right. I got to turn in them papers. I got to show up to class. I got I got to be there. Yeah. So it's been helping me transition to the new world, man. So um, wow. It's good to be free. So really quickly, another quote wow. from Michelle Alexander, uh, the author of The New Jim Crow. As of 2004, more black men were disenfranchised due to felon disenfranchisement laws than in 1870, the year the 15th Amendment was ratified, prohibiting laws that explicitly deny a regular, or, or denied on a regular basis of race. So again, okay, we need to find a way. This is why I say, look, I'm about to wax philosophical here. Entropy. Second law of thermodynamics, right? You have, you know, the laws of, you guys understand yeah. entropy? Okay, or the first law of thermodynamics is energy can never be destroyed, it can only change form. Well, the second law talks about systems and they break down, right? The longer a system goes on, the more it will break down and reach a watershed point where it is no longer usable. But because energy is never destroyed, the system evolves into something else. Mm -hmm. So now, the birth of slavery, death of slavery. Birth of Jim Crow, death of Jim Crow. Birth of mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. You see, entropy works that way, right? Well, this system is broken all the way down. You can apply entropy to hip hop, mm -hmm. right? In the beginning, hip hop was love and fun and excitement and energy and yeah, and now it's business and whack and bunk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it yeah. just, it, it, you, you understand what I'm saying? The content is lower. Mm -hmm. The consciousness is lower. So the longer something goes on, the more it begins to break down. So uh, my whole point is, at what point do we stand up and go, fuck this, mm -hmm. enough is enough. There's 7 billion people on the planet Earth. The 1% is called the 1% because they only make up 1%. Mm -hmm. A pawn is only a pawn because he believes to be. Mm -hmm. it, 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 the pawn has, you get to the other side of the board, you can be whatever, whatever piece you want. <laughs> but because we're indoctrinated with pawn mentality, pawn software, listen, the root word of champion is peon. Mm. It's just the greatest of the peons, which is related to pawn. <laughs> the belief system is what is your real prison. Uh, I'm gonna get off the soapbox. Uh, Tariq Nasheed, we need more information, man, about this situation and how we educate, not just the boys, but the girls. Do you understand? It, we, we can't interface with a system any longer that really has never had our back, our best intentions, or anything like that, correct? We can no longer, we have to learn how to police ourselves. Again, I said this on the last show, they're going to legislate your behavior. Mm -hmm. And either way, they're gonna make money off of it. Tariq, speak to that. This is why it's so important for us, people of color, to have an economic base. <laughs> yes. Because we are targeted economically. They have economic warfare on us. And what they're going to do is target the weakest people economically. This is why you don't see Asian people getting funneled into the prison system. Ooh. Because their economy can combat that. Mm. We don't have an economy. We don't have an economic base. We don't have businesses. When we get that going on, then we can have the best lawyers. We can hire the best attorneys. We can create an economic system that will protect us from being targeted by law enforcement. So we have to start there. But they're going to continue to do it because we can't look at it from a moral standpoint. Just like slavery should not have been looked at from a moral standpoint. What they should have done in slavery, and I've always said this about the abolitionists, instead of saying, okay, religious this and moral that, they should have said, we're not going to buy any products made by slavery. Come on. That would have stopped slavery overnight. We have to get to a position where we say, look, they're going to keep making money off us, so we're That's going to circulate our money among each other to combat that. We have to look at it from an economic standpoint and how to combat it economically. All right. We are going to take a break. <laughs> and when we come back, will it be my rant when we come back? Yes. It will be Jeff Brown's rant. And then we're coming back to Kylie. Oh, oh yeah, and then Kylie, Kylie, hold on, baby. Hold on, hold on. We've we just been talking. Hang out. And then we, we coming back. And I'm going to say some ignorant mess about spending 20 years and then don't do it back. We'll talk about that. We'll see you in a minute.
my God, how he has a rap career is beyond me. I don't get it. I don't, and he takes his shirt off. Oh my God, he looks like 50 pounds of chewed Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. Now you are in white fashion. You know white boys always leave the house like they're gonna help somebody move. <laughs> and defend the horrible hoes. There are some horrible people. And what you need to do is start policing your own. Uh, which is how I like to start all of these. Uh, uh, uh. uh. <laughs> I think it's time that we shift our fears as a people. Um, white people first. Shift your fears, okay? This concept, this fallacy that's in every movie, that's in every commercial, in everybody's mouth, that the ghetto is this dangerous place. They don't finish it. There's a preposition that goes on the end of that. For black people. The ghetto is the safest place in the world for white folks. Mm. You can walk down, you can go over to the jungle in L.A. right now in your drawers <laughs> with $100 bills hanging out of them. <laughs> and nothing will happen to you because everybody black knows what happens when a hair is harmed on your head. Stop that. You do not have to be afraid of us. If you did, where's the real big white body count? Where's mm. all the white people we're killing? They only kill each other. Second, I fear, I have shifted my fears. I have shifted my fears. When I see young brothers with cornrows and, 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 and plaid, I, I don't look at him immediately as a gangster. I think that's an entrepreneur. That's a dude that has said, you know what? Fuck a regular job. I'm selling incense and pit bull puppies out the back of my car. <laughs> and the one with the ring around his eye is $50 extra. <laughs> Petey. Yeah, Petey. You want Petey? You want Petey? I need 50 more dollars. Okay? I don't fear dudes that rob liquor stores. I fear dudes that rob SNLs, mm. that uh, bankrupt countries and uh, outsource jobs. And those dudes do not look like the dude to my right. They look like the dude to my left. Now, I love this guy, but the, vi the biggest villains in history have come in three-piece suits and in fake wigs with white hair. Not Bloods, wow. not Crips. The biggest gangsters. The biggest gangsters. When, when, what pyrus do you know have an atomic bomb? None. None. Those cats that are behind bars, a lot of them, a lot of them, and I speak out to them, and I wish peace to them, especially to the ones, in the words of Ice Cube, that ain't got no date. Uh, we praying for you, and we working for you, right out here and right now. Start fearing white dudes in suits, because they ain't going to break in your house, God damn it, they going to just take it. So, that's the rant, really quickly. And, and Jeff, that was an excellent rant. Really quickly, we got a brother who was there during the civil rights and before the civil rights, and, and that's Uncle Bobby. And Yo, I love having yes. Uncle Bobby on the show because he provides perspective. And if you don't know, go get his book, Real Men Don't Play, from uh, realmendontplay.com. Buy the book. It's important. This is why we have him on the show. Bobby, what did our community look like before integration? And, did, and were we better at policing our own than we are today? Speak to that. Um, <clears throat> well, there was a community of necessity. Uh, the law forced us, compelled us to take care of each other. And without being idyllic about that, it was just out of necessity. We didn't know any other way to survive because everything was right there. The boundaries were very apparent to us. If you went beyond State Street in my home, I mean Main Street in my hometown, you immediately knew that you had to have a different protocol. You didn't look at people because they looked differently. They were white folks, and you didn't look them in the eye. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't necessarily a charge on the books, but you would go to jail for recklessly eyeballing white yeah, folks. Man. Wow. wow. And, uh, that was understood. Uh, from an economic standpoint, we were a much healthier community because... You had to work. Welfare was not an option. And so 
people had trades. You know, you saw professional people because you couldn't go to a white doctor. So you had a white, a, a black doctor. My uncle ran a grocery store in my hometown, so he got the business because there wasn't nowhere else for you to go. Mm -hmm. And then the education was an absolute necessity because you didn't have the option of not going to school, and you were driven to go further than your parents got. So there was a different uh, sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. And again, it wasn't idyllic. It was just no option. You had to be close. Right. And you had to look out for each other. And the last thing you was going to be was disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You weren't going to break in somebody's house because you was too close. Mm -hmm. And where you going to hock the stuff anyway? <laughs> you know, so they know that came from somewhere that y'all, <laughs> you know. You're trying to sell me back my couch. Yeah. Brother, Ter <laughs> Brother Terry spoke to something that really stood out to me, and I hear it often, and I agree with it, the piece around how we need an economic stability amongst us. And then we, all, we often, we compare ourselves, we go, we, you look at these other communities, and they have an economic base, whether it's Asian folks or Jewish people. or But what you can go to a Chinese mechanic, and Buddha and a bowl of fruit is up on the shelf. Right. And you go, we're here in Hollywood, you go to a network in December, the Hanukkah thing is huge in the lobby. Mm -hmm. That we also are talking to a people who are connected to what their spiritual understanding of themselves are. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we care about? Mm -hmm. And what is our religion? I, I, our religion is... Though we, we, there, there's a kind of general wash of us having a Christian bag, that's not really what we praise and what we're really into. We are into uh, a, a, a search for a, a black version of white identity. Mm -hmm. We are, um, you know, sisters Ooh. are passionate about scandal, and, 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 and I even hear brothers talking about watching Real Atlanta Housewives. and uh, These are things we really care about. Because as a person that's a part of this, this work, to end the criminalization of young people and social justice work, it's not a lot of black folks at the table. When you go to the courtroom or the protest or if you're at the organization, this is not what we're passionate about. It's, it's not what we into. You get more feverish attitude about um, a Pop Warner football game than, right. than real social justice stuff amongst us. We don't know about it. We're not into it. And we're also ostracized by, we talk about the prison industrial complex, so we got to talk about the nonprofit industrial complex. Uh-oh, uh-oh, that's we're, a whole nother hustle. We're talking about the, non, the nonprofit industrial so, complex. So really quickly, I want to get word from Kylie because she's on with us right now. I know you've been listening to us, and I know you've been hearing some of our grieves, you know, grievances and the soapbox we on, but this is a real situation that plagues our community. How in the hell can we be free and try to experience some form of justice when the system is set up to be unequal? Speak to that. Ageism, racism, sexism, classism. Can you go into that, please? <laughs> yeah, in 30 seconds, you want an answer to that? No, no, give it to uh, us, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, no, I think there's some really, really great points that have been raised, and, and there's a couple things I want to hit on, which uh, one of them is, is I think there was some, you, you were talking about shifting your fears, mm. um, and I think that speaks to really, you know, the social norms that, that, that are around us, and, and there's a, some really excellent work that is happening um, around what kind of shapes those social norms. I think that the National Hispanic Media Coalition um, has has done some really good uh, unpacking of even the news reporting um, and how news reporting reinforces some of those stereotypes and tells us to be afraid of people of color. Um, you know, so you're saying, you know, where where is, is there an African American media coalition um, that can look at at even the news media, not even the movies, um, but actual news reporting, and how does that reinforce racial stereotypes and fear? Um, and, and they've done some really interesting work pegging it to budget cycles. Um, so, so I think there's there's definitely work that's there that people can, can access, and, and there's a space there to do some really interesting stuff around changing our norms, because you're right. When you look at the data, again, uh, you know, uh, we, we do a lot of work with gun violence prevention, and, and there's a very, very insidious uh, edge to some of this, this uh, messaging that happens around, you know, who needs a gun and who they need to protect themselves from. Wow. Um, and then when you look at the data, it is not that black people are breaking into white people's homes. Um, it is not that black people are threatening white people. It's, you know, white people are killed by guns 
very, very rarely. Wow. Um, except in these mass shootings. Um, but you do get, you know, the, 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 <laughs> the highest victim of gun violence are, are young African-American men. So let so, me just so say this really quickly. To address that is really a bit irresponsible. Indeed, indeed. And that was great stuff. Hold on for one more second. Let me just say this. They've been creating a narrative to be afraid of black men since and before then the birth of a nation. You have to understand the power of media. The first time they got a movie camera, they put together a blockbuster to be afraid of the animalistic, ravenous black man. Reefer madness. And, and, and that philosophy has been in place in some form or another. Even if it's Allen Iverson, I don't like your braids. Mm -hmm. Right? In some form or, or another, that's been in place. Dr. G, you wanted to make a point. Make it really quickly. Yeah, uh, what do you think of this? As long as you deny your anger at another person, you will always be afraid of them. Wow. I'll take that. And we'll take that to break. And when we come back, Tariq Nasheed, melodiously fly. The whole panel is going to get deeper into this thing. This is crazy today. We'll be back at 2.2. Wow. <laughs> you know I know that ain't your error, Bobby. I know. It's just the music. He should have put some of that Jane Brown, you know, uh, tempo no, to no, it. No, 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 no. That's actually, that actually <laughs> no. is James Brown <laughs> tempo. No, that was, that was, <laughs> what? That was Jim, that's Jane what? Brown that's on Geritol or something, man. <laughs> Listen. Do you skate? Do you skate? Backwards. Okay. Oh, yeah, no. damn. <laughs> so, so, listen, I want to throw it to Tariq Nasheed, man. I played the video because a homeboy of mine, he put that, that song together a few years back, and I always play it, but then he told me he had a video to it, and the visual is really powerful Ridiculous. in terms of w what we're talking about, man. We did a show about modern-day slavery a couple weeks back, and I was saying, it's contradictory, and it's, it's hypocrisy for us to be outraged when we live in a system that's based on various types of slavery, right? It is, it's, it is, this is a moral outcry. Bring our <laughs> girls back. Stop it. Yeah. Stop it. We're imprisoned by the IRS, mm. right? Just, right? On the real. We're imprisoned by a nine to five mentality, right? We're imprisoned by marriage to a certain degree, right? Fuck, we just did the show on the potential collateral damage of marriage and how it's a bad deal for men that could ultimately lead them to prison, right? Then when you hear people talk about the privatized system, they use the same terminology. The potential collateral damage for copping to a plea deal. Because, you, yeah, don't, don't go to a trial because a trial may prove you innocent, but the fear of it not proving you innocent and you getting a bigger sentence makes you take the deal. But you take the deal without knowing the, collater the potential collateral damage. The potential collateral damage is you're going to be branded a second-class citizen for the rest of your life. What fleas is with this dog? On the outside. Tariq, speak to me, man. You know, they just had a case in New York that New York had to pay out $40 million to these five brothers. Speak. They, were got, they got caught up in this case in the late 80s. In New York, they had this whole propaganda campaign called Wilding, where they were locking brothers up left and right in groups. Remember, because in the late 80s, that's when they started to privatize the prisons very heavily mm -hmm. and funnel those brothers in the prison. Right when they did that, they start putting out these stories of bands of black men going around doing crimes, Wilding. They got these five brothers in New York who were underage, got them in the, in the interrogation room, scare them into making a confession. And that's another thing. When you get in those interrogation rooms, as my brother right here can attest to, they start telling you stuff like, look, I know you didn't do it, but the jury's not going to believe it. Say you did it and you'll go home. Mm. So a kid who's scared underage, he don't know any better. He's going to say whatever the cop tells him to say, and they're going to give him life anyway. Mm. Now, they did that with these gentlemen. Unfortunately for the cops, the real dude came out and confessed to doing it. So they had to let these brothers out of, out of prison, and now they're getting a settlement. Now, this happens a lot in the prison system. You got a lot of young men who are coerced into admitting to crimes that they didn't do. And now, like I said, they're getting them in groups. And what they have now in the country, they have something called the knockout game propaganda. They're talking about this knockout game. People are hearing this knockout game. They're pretending that black people are collectively playing a game 
where they're randomly knocking out innocent white people. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody has any proof of a game that's being played, but if they say it enough, that's all you need to get a law passed. And they're literally trying to get laws passed for this so-called knockout game. Similar so, to the whole thing around Latinos are trying to force black folks out of historically black neighborhoods. And on one hand, there's a real conflict there, but they not forcing us out the way that Wells Fargo or other home lenders are gentrifying. Absolutely, yeah, exactly. A, a heavy thing, you know. Exactly, exactly. So we gotta watch the propaganda campaign. And again, this is why we need that economic base because when we have jobs and employment for our own people, we don't have to worry about getting into that street life and getting a million years over something that's supposed to be a misdemeanor. Right. You could get you could fix that black Mexican thing with one big barbecue. I agree. Just one big barbecue served the right shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My issue we were talking about you were talking about everybody's kind of been uh, uh, knocking around blacks having their own economic base. Mm. Um, the first thing we have to break, but we have to do even before that, is break our worship of money. Mm -hmm. Black people think that money is power. It is not. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter, it's just minor privilege. Money, mm -hmm. That's all money is, is privilege. And I can't, uh, 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 to, to, to make this point, I can't go buy a house, even if I hit Powerball mm -hmm. off of Highland and Third, mm -mm. because a lot of rich old Jews live there. And when they decide to sell a house, ain't going to be no sign in the grass. Uncle Saul is going to sell that house to Uncle Ira, who's going to put his son in it, who just had a baby with his wife. Right. And your money, there are certain places, it, it your ain't no money good. is no good, it's black no good. people. There are certain things you cannot buy really quickly. This is a Mike Tyson story. Uh, uh, Mike Tyson had a Ferrari that he had to hide because he bought it out of order. There's an order. There's a hierarchy. <laughs> you can't just buy this Ferrari. And somebody saw him driving around in it that was in line for the car, and they dimed him out. And a friend of mine, who shall remain nameless, had to help Mike and hide that Ferrari wow. until they could straighten it all out. Wow, wow. Listen, Doc, Dr. G, and of course, speak to, what's your name again? Frankie. Mike? Frankie, I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, it's just, it's very passionate. Frankie Four Fingers. I want Frankie Four Fingers, you understand? <laughs> Don't make me call Frankie. Frankie Four Fingers. Yeah. <laughs> no, so Doc and Frankie, Doc, you've been there as a psychiatrist, where you've been able to peer through the mind of someone who's been institutionalized, right, behind big bars. You've been there 20 years, experience. Mm. Speak to me about what this place does to the mind, because I know it has nothing to do with rehabilitation. This is why the recidivation, uh, the, the recidivism, what's the word? Recidivism. Recidivism. This is why that rate is so high, right? It, it, it's just designed to get you back in there, and it locks you into a certain kind of mentality. Can you speak to what these prisons do to the mind? Well, let's, uh, let Frankie go, because uh, he's been there. That has more expertise than me, and then, and then I'll weigh in, but go ahead. So... You asked about the mind, so I'll stick with that, but I think it's also designed to break your spirit. But that's a different question that you're, that you're not asking. But the mind, you know, my, my incarceration spans the entire system from juvenile hall, county jail, YA, and then adult prison. So I hit the entire spectrum in one shot. I'm going to pick up Folsom Prison. I'm 30 years old, and the dudes who are around me are lifers. These are dudes who've been in ranging from 10, 15, 20, 40 years. And the mentality is that you're a reject from society, and these are general statements, so I don't want to make, you know, this, not everyone. Uh, you're a reject from society. Um, uh, no, no, one, no one likes you, no one wants you around. Um, you're, if, if you're on a path of, of, of enlightenment, you're, 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 you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And but a lot of guys try that, and, but then there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to shine, there's nothing to do with that. Wow. So they resort back to just, sort of just being, being a prisoner. And a lot of dudes, and looking back, and it's really from a flashback mentality where I'm thinking about this as a lot of guys come to age in prison. Mm -hmm. So they, they're discovering who they are for the first time as individuals, as men. Within a cage. Within a cage, which wow. is tragic, which is, which is a tragedy because, you know, you're expecting society, your family, loved ones to have an influence on you. But instead, you're in, you're, you're in an in a, in a, in a, in a environment with, with a bunch of strangers who are also trying to figure out what the hell is going on with themselves and so on. Um, and so the mentality, if you're strong enough, you can, you can keep it together, and if you're not, 
then then you, you don't you're going to get consumed doc you know there, there's something called uh, and, and frank i'd be interested if what you think about this but there was a term years ago called learned helplessness mm -hmm. and it was started by a guy uh, martin seligman who's now in the, into positive psychology and resilience, mm -hmm. but long ago he, he, he created the term learned helplessness, which means that when there's no way out, you, you kind of adapt to it, and you adapt to it, and so what happens is you're kind of reduced to just, you know, sort of making it through the day. Mm -hmm. You don't even have a mentality that you could build or grow anything, mm -hmm. because you think that whatever you try is just not going to work out. And so you're just, you're just kind of existing and surviving, and there's a real kind of discouragement and despair. So would you agree with anything? I totally yeah. agree. Wow. Very, very poignant. you got about 10 seconds, Bobby. Well, because I've had the, the privilege of working with Jim Brown's American program for the last 20-some-odd years, I've dealt with brothers who have been out uh, and successfully transitioned back into life because they had to make a personal decision whether they stayed in that framework of I don't know how to adapt to this, or they admit that they have to really just start a whole another get down. And he reminds me so much of a cat that uh, I feature in my book, Julian Mendoza, and we talked about him a little bit on the break, because it does tie into the fact that the black and brown thing changed in the time that he was in prison. Wow. And that's something that we really need to look at, too, is the fact that they have divided people along racial lines right. and, and permitted that to filter back out into the streets. Wow. When we come back, we're going to talk with Jasmine. She has some very, mm. very heavy things to say in terms of women and their treatment in the penal system. Mm. We'll be back in 2.2. Now I have a chance to see him live, and I'm so excited. Something is wrong if we are 5% of the population in Toronto and nearly 50% of those confined for criminal action. Something is wrong. Something is wrong in the United States if we are 12% of the population and nearly 70% of those in the jails and federal penitentiaries of America. America has the largest population of uh, criminals anywhere to be found in the world. 1.6 a million is the recorded number. There may be more. 1.6 million prisoners. So today the fastest growing industry in America is the prison industrial complex. The, the, uh, the, law, uh, the, the legislatures have said three strikes and you're in prison for life. A few years ago, the statistics were that one out of every four black people in the United States was either in prison or connected to the criminal justice system. Now it's one in three. So there's hardly any young black person that has not offended the law. So from teenagers, we may run into trouble with the law, and by the time we're 20, we may have three offenses. No matter what those offenses are, three offenses, and you're locked down for the rest of your natural life. And so what is happening today, it's a modern form of slavery using crime. Okay. Okay, I didn't hear Minister <laughs> Farrakhan called a lot of things. I didn't heard him call a race baiter, an instigator, a Jew hater. Am I rhyming? He's been called all those things. Here's one word I've never heard him called, ever, by anyone. Liar. So that just means you don't like what he got to say. Right, right, right. And, and uh, again, I mean, I'm going through this whole thing because I look at the apathy that is associated with our community. I look at the, you know, pursuit 
the pursuit of validation in a society that's never really wanted you guys, <sighs> us. You know, for the Latino brother, they keep us at, our, at each other's neck in the neighborhood, or at least the perception of that. Media is a powerful drug. It's a hell of a drug, right? But at the end of the day, the, the, the Latino family's got to deal with, you know, <laughs> deportation. Mm -hmm. The black family's got to deal with mass incarceration. They, they both, you know. And they're dealing with the same dignity deficit. Yeah. And you're, also, and, and you're also dealing with the same white aspiration. You turn on Telemundo, television, all that, all them black people that's in the Latin world, Everybody white on the Spanish speaking channel. Yeah. They all are are light in it's Argentina, it's the same kind of piece. Chile, yeah. Brazil, yeah. all of these countries. Mm -hmm. You know? Speak to us, sister. You know, and I just wanted to point out that black women as well are overly represented in the prison industrial complex. And recently in the state of California, there's been an audit into the forced sterilizations that's been going on. Ooh. He mentioned Folsom. Ooh. Folsom is one of the prisons that's being audited right now. So if black women, if we represent the majority of the women, female population among races, that means that they're sterilizing black women in prison. And I wondered if Kylie is still on the line, I wanted to pose that question to her if she's heard about this, because it's something that's fairly new that's been coming out, a lot of articles being written. And what do you think are some of the incentives? Why are they forcing women to be sterilized in prison without their knowledge? Without their knowledge? Is she still there? Yeah. Yeah, they're doing it without their knowledge. They do don't that? know. There's a law. There's a law called Buck versus Bell that makes it perfect. Whoa, 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 whoa. Give them, give them a microphone. Because yeah. like a lot of people have that same question. How can they do that without your, your knowledge? They have a law. I want y'all to look this up called Buck versus Bell, where they can sterilize you without your consent. And it was a law passed in 1927, and it's still on the books. It was never overturned. No, I didn't say without your and consent. I said without you knowing. Like, is it a sandwich? Well, oh, they is can, it? man, the Norplants, all that stuff, it's dude. It's a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> what happens is that these women are going under surgical, you know, okay. during okay. surgery for other things, you know, and then, oh, well, why we're fixing your kidneys, let's just sterilize you. Yeah, exactly. We're well, taking your tonsils <laughs> out. Exactly. You know? And we touch oh. on that in Hidden Colors 3, by the way. We, we go deep on that. A lot of birth control is sterilizing black women yes. right now. A lot of folks don't know about it. And you have to understand also, wow. with, with the whole feminist movement, they brought black women in to sterilize them. Like wow. people like Margaret Sanger back in the 1920s and 30s. Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood. Parenthood. That was designed to sterilize black women. And okay. they said it. It's not even a conspiracy. And not only does it sterilize you, it messes with you hormonally. Like women that have been on birth control for years become emotionally, like, dead. Like, it literally kind of almost them. kills your nurturing instinct. Control, yeah, it takes a long time to cleanse. I've never touched the stuff. Wow. So let me, let, Bobby? Yeah, uh, here's the good news. We've reached, I think, the, uh, the peak of the prison industrial complex. It has nothing to do with morality. It has to do with economics. They literally cannot afford to support that system any longer because it just costs too much money. Well, that's the federal side. The no, federal prisons states are going bankrupt. That's what we're talking about. The state part of it. We're not talking about the private prisons now. The state part of it is it's too it's too expensive to keep these things going, right? They don't have the money. However, the private prisons, they are the ones that are approaching the state prisons and saying, "Hey, look, we'll we'll buy this prison from you, but you got to promise us that you're going to keep that prison full regardless of the crime rate." And again, how do we do that? We're in bed with lobbyists hey, who are in bed with politicians, up. right? Uh, Travis Bickle? Hey, how you doing, man? Are you uh, one of the lobbyists? Uh, no, but I, hey, I'll tell I you one thing, though, so, uh, and, here, and again, it's some good... <laughs> Hold your thought, Darky. Now listen. <laughs> Oh, he got jokes. Yeah. <laughs> Travis Bickle, say Somebody your point. Somebody locked up right now. He <laughs> all got I'm jokes. saying. <laughs> okay. All I'm saying is hell. All right? They're, they're, they're doing the shit you're saying they're doing. And if I can get a pair of pants for $9 as opposed to 60 and all you got to do is lock up some black men to get it done, well, shit, I got five kids. Nine times six is 54 bucks. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. This is after economics from the white man's point of Bobby, <laughs> go ahead, Bobby. The good news. Um, <laughs> for those of us who are not <laughs> presently incarcerated, uh, and for those of us who have spent a little bit of time in jail, here's what we got to do. We have got to pivot away from the attitude that there's nothing that we can do about this. Absolutely. Because it, it absolutely is something that we can Speak do. Speak to it, Bobby. First thing we have to do is understand that 
Freedom is not free. So in order for us to begin to address the social problems, we have to deal with the economic problems. And there's a, a movement right now, there's some gentlemen around the country that have initiated an agenda that includes taking private equity and refocusing that money back into what they used to call the inner city. And now it's home to white folks. Mm -hmm. all right, you go wow. to all the major cities in the United States yes. right now, you see cranes. They're building vertically. All right, as a result, what we have to do is get that information back into our communities so that we follow the money for real. I, I have a quick question for the entire panel. T does success kind of alienate you from all of this that's going on? I think a lot of times black people think if I, if I got a good education, if I have a great career, if I have money, you, you know. Because we go to college and, and, they feel and like, we don't just graduate from college, we try to graduate from black people. <laughs> and that's, and that's, a, that's our sickness, that's our illness, that, they, we, are, that we are chasing. It's a, a false idea that you're going to become so successful that you'll be able to shed off your blackness. If I, if I ask this question, I've asked this question, I was uh, teaching at, at Princeton, I, asked, I said to a room full of black people, if I gave a if I could sell a pill right now that you could take and opt out of blackness, would you take it? And they laughed. Everybody was like, oh, no, no. But think about it. If sisters can have their hair look like their hair or look like other people's hair, mm -hmm. they opt out. If we have the ability to not live amongst us, we tend to not live amongst them. We opt if we, out. We, if, if you have the ability to go... We some opting out ass if, motherfuckers. If you have the ability to go to business, <laughs> you can get a, 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 a full ride to Morehouse or... A um, full ride to Stanford. No, no, no. Or pay 200 G's to go to Stanford. You Mama gonna go. gonna figure out them loans and go to Stanford instead of taking a full ride at Morehouse. There's an opt out thing we have of ourselves about opting out of our blackness, and I think that makes us more susceptible to these attacks that ride on us. We're going out with a little rapture. Jade Mitchell, melodiously fly. Where can they find this real quick? You can find it on Bandcamp, J. Mitchell at Melodious Fly, spelled phonetically correct. All my music is available for purchase and free download. She's a beautiful woman, she's intelligent, and, and she makes the show great. We'll be back in 2.2 with a uh, final thought. Great show. Great show, guys. Um, again, I, I appreciate the think tank. I appreciate, uh, you know, the different perspectives. I appreciate you, your voice, you know. I appreciate everybody who's here, man. We got to continue to do this kind of stuff. And I, I'm just going to say it really quickly. The greatest act of terrorism that blacks could perform is to unify. And I, 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 you have to understand Black Wall Street to understand what I mean by that. Over 600 businesses, right? That was an act of terrorism that prompted the first ever bombing of a U.S. city, of a US city from the sky, Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> because we were together. Because we policed our own. Because we valued each other. I'm tired of the bootstrap argument. I'm tired of the do right by the system and it will do right by you argument. When there are forces in place that will create a product, a prisoner, a slave out of your, si out of your children. Just because they're not performing right. How many of you mothers out there got to deal with a student that yeah, maybe you're raising a kid by yourself, right? And, and it's hard for you to get him to school on time, and you have to deal with the truancy issue that, you know, we will take your kid and get him in the system one way or other because you can't get him to school, right? I mean, they're finding, I said this before, they're finding ways to legislate our behavior, to criminalize our behavior. And the only way, I believe, to fix that is to start wanting to be with each other again. 
Like we don't even want to be with each other. My brother spoke on opting out. Whenever there's an opportunity to opt out, we opt out. It's, it's a hurtful thing. You know, the Bill Cosby's and all these people in the bourgeoisie, hey, go to school, go to school, go to school, go to school. Go. That ain't the answer. They don't teach you to think for yourself. They teach you how to think and to be somewhat acceptable to them. But make no mistake, if they have an opportunity to marginalize and put you down and subjugate you, they will. Is this a victim cry? No. It's the same thing my counselor, Miss Pentecost, in the ninth grade told me. Hey, you see Miss Sumner right down the hall? We do the same job, baby. But I had to be 10 times better than her to get the same pay to be in this school. Right? What if we took that same mentality and started to put it back into our community? Put it back into our, I gotta be 10 times better, but I gotta be 10 times better for us. Not 10 times better so they can see, so they can acknowledge, so they can accept. See, these are our hopes and dreams. Acknowledge, see, accept me. I'm qualified to be with you, amongst you, white Jesus. Right? I, I think that's the problem. It's not a race. I, black people can't be racist. We don't have no power. Right? When we get power, should we be racist? No, we should just be for self. Does it mean exclude and kick everybody else out? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means imagine what kind of threat we become when we're coalesced together. This is, I always use this, this quote. It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Krishnamurti, we are always trying to be perfect in the eyes of those who, whose hate for us is on autopilot. It's unconscious, they don't even know. <laughs> Just, mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You feel me? In a hate cloud. <laughs> right, right? It's just, it's just what it is. When you go up to Stanford, they're doing research on stereotype, stereotype threat. We're the people that's always adjusting to, how do you see me? Let me change my name from Shaniqua to Stacy, so I can get this job. Let me put, uh, fine uh, Indian perm shag weave so I can look more acceptable, right? There, you, I'm just frustrated. Mm. And I love my people, but I hate our apathy. Our hate, I hate our self-hate. I hate our wounds because we baby the wounds. I just want to pass it around to the table and just thank everybody for coming. Ice, where can they find you, brother? This is Ice Life. You can find me on Twitter and every other thing that's out there like that at I-S-E-L-Y-F-E at Twitter.com on Instagram and at IceLife.com. Thank you, my brother. And Frankie, yo, what's Frankie, up, what's going on? where can they find you, Frankie? You know, <laughs> ain't not for nothing. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And, you know, I want to forget just, about it. Forget about it, man. But, you know, <laughs> let, let me just say this, man. Um, you know, when I was in the joint, I, I promised myself if I ever got out, I was going to try to unite myself with people, circles, who were trying to do what I wish somebody was doing and, and are doing, paradigm shift about guys coming out of prison, men and women. People assume they're destroyed, they're broken, they, you know, you should stay away from them. And I'm leaving proof that that's not the case. You know, you, there's life after incarceration. So now I hang out with people like Anti-Recidivism Coalition here in L.A., Innocence Project, Northern California, and Death Penalty Focus, man, because we, we, death penalty is, is a huge problem here in California as well. We can't ignore it. Brother Bobby. Uh, shout out to our fellow comrade, Corey Hoka, for jumping off that movie this week. Uh, yes, yes, like yes, man. yes, yes. And I'm going to make it plain for you. Just Google Real Men Don't Play, and then you'll find all of that. If you go deep enough, you'll see where I did go to jail. Oh, there we go. By, uh, Dr. G. Hey, just Mark Goulston at markgoulston.com. I'd like us to do a show, and what would, what would the picture look like that would result in people being proud to be black? Woo! Wow. <laughs> I love it. We'll bring everybody back. Wow. Uh, my man, Jeff Brown. 
this Saturday, look for me doing red carpet for T Radio V at Wendy Raquel's red carpet at the Modern There you go, there you go. Hey, Tariq, everything you're doing, tell them real quick. Hey, Hidden Colors 3 is going to be in theaters this Thursday and Friday all around the country. Get showtimes and theater locations at HiddenColorsFilm.com. Sell this movie out. Yes, Sell this movie yes, out. Yes, indeed. It's already sold out in New York and Dallas. Follow me on Twitter at Tariq Nasheed. And y'all hit me up by my porn name on Google. That's Denzel Sausageton. And... <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but uh, follow me on Facebook at Tariq Lee. <laughs> but Hidden Color is coming to theaters this Thursday. New uh, train. Okay. And Jasmine. Yeah, new oh. train. You can find me here at Melodious Fly. Um, I'm an artist. I'm a singer, musician. I'm making music. Support me. Don't support Nicki Minaj's. I'm here. I care. I'm a real yeah. artist in the community. Please support me. Peace. In other words, Support everything we're doing. Please. Go buy blackmastery.com, neurolinguistic program. Go get it right now. Undo Willie Lynch, self hate. Blackmastery.com, Veronica Conway, get at her. Veronica at veronicaconway.com. Email her. Eight week boot camp. Follow me at Zoe Williams on Twitter, at Mr. Zoe What on Instagram. I appreciate my family, but I swear to God, we gotta do better. This is a hurtful topic for me because there's a lot of pain in our community, man, and, and it, just, it, it just becomes our narrative, and I'm trying to break that. So I'll see you guys next week with another barn burner. Deuces!